everybody, it's Matt from Eastwood. Uh, thanks for joining in on our live beginner's welding demo. I'm going to show you some tips and tricks to make you a better welder and uh, also some things to look out, look out for along the way if you're doing any bad welds or anything like that. So the key along the way is to make sure that you clean your, your area really well that you're welding on and also you have your welder settings correct. So we're going to be using the Eastwood MIG-175 today but this is going to be the same for any welder that you're using, no matter what the brand is or the style. These settings going to apply to any of those. So the first thing we're going to show you is four basic weld joints. Now the first weld joint that we're going to show you that probably everyone learns originally when they start welding is this one. It's called a butt joint, butt weld joint, just like it sounds. So you're going to put two pieces of metal together like this, and then you lay a bead in between them. So the key is to get your settings just right so you penetrate both pieces. You can see the heat effective zone here on both sides. So you know that you melted in correctly. So that's the first one there. You're going to be using that all the time when you're fabricating, doing automotive, auto body repair, anything like that. Now the next one is what's called a lap joint. And that's where you're actually lapping or laying two pieces of metal, one over top of the other, and you're going to weld just on the edge here. Now the edge of that weld is going to penetrate down onto the other one, stick the two of them together. Now the next one is what's called an angle or T-joint. Now an angle or T-joint is just like this. You can see obviously where it gets its name. And what you're doing is you're going to be welding and laying a puddle right in this joint here. So that's, that's going to be a really common one. Again, when you're doing any kind of fabrication, you're going to want to learn this one. Now the, the last one that's probably one of the most important, especially if you're doing restorations, anything like that, is learning how to do a good spot weld. A good spot weld is going to look something like this. It's going to be really nice and flat. and It doesn't protrude above the surface. So you don't want to do too much grinding. I mean, when you're doing, especially when you're doing automotive or sheet metal work, you want to do as little grinding as possible. So laying a nice flat spot weld is going to save you from heating up the panel as you're doing your grinding and smoothing of the metal. So if you're new at doing spot welds, or if you plan on doing a lot of spot welds in a row, we came up with a handy kit. It's the Eastwood MIG Welding Spot Kit. Now basically what this is, is an attachment that fits on the end of any Tweco style MIG gun. Just threads right on. And this gives you these standoffs here. They're at the perfect distance. It gets you sitting just right at the right angle above the metal so you can do perfect spot welds every time. And like I said, this is really handy if you're doing a lot of spot welds along the way. So if you're doing like a patch panel or something like that, you need to just continuously be doing spot welds. This is going to get nice flat spot welds that look the same every single time. So this is a really key product. We have uh, some of the products under the video here. And this is one of them that you can check out and learn a little more information after we're done the uh, live feed here. Now the next thing we're going to show you now, we showed you the basic joints, is how to set your machine up. What are the things on the front of your machine, what do they mean? So what I'm going to show you here on the Eastwood MIG-175, now this is going to be similar to a lot of machines, but ours has infinite adjustability, so any of these dials here, they can be turned in any which way. Your welder at home may have individual settings where it's just like three, four, five, anything that you can individually click, there's no in between. So we added the adjustability, um, which is a nice feature on ours, but no matter what welder you're using, it's going to have these same things. So the first one here is arc volts, how we have it listed on our machine. Could be voltage, could be heat, anything like that on your machine. And it's just like it sounds, the heat. That's going to be the higher the voltage, the higher the heat, so that's going to be the hotter the weld. Now the other one on here, the real basic setting that you need to know is the wire speed just like it sounds, really easy. How fast the wire's coming out of the gun. So obviously the higher you turn the number up, the faster the, sp the speed of the wire is going to come out. Now some machines, like ours here, may have some presets in the machine that doesn't allow you to do something at, a, at an extreme. So it may not allow you to have the machine cranked at the highest temperature and the lowest wire speed. It may just not function or it may, it may have a preset that it only allows you to go you know, at max in five or something like that. Um, so that's something to remember when you start playing with your machine. If you accidentally bump it, that could be why. So now that we got those basics for the machine set up, we're going to show you how to do or how not to do 
some bad welds. This is something that we get all the time with beginners that are learning how to MIG weld is they call us up trying to get us to diagnose why their welder isn't working correctly or why their welds are look poor or they, um, you know, they could just be looking for advice. So the first one we're going to show you is if you have your machine set too hot or possibly the wire speed's too slow, um, could be anything like that. So here's the first instance. It's too hot. So it's just burning right through the metal. You can obviously see it's just making a mess on the edge of the joint. You know, if you're welding a joint together, it's just blowing it away. So this is just way too hot um, of a setting. Could maybe even be that your wire's too large. Sometimes if you have a, you know, like an 030 and you're working on sheet metal, you could need to be doing a 023 wire. Um, that's much better for real like 20 or 22 gauge sheet metal. Um, so that's what you might experience with that. Now another instance where you may have the settings too high or the wire speed too low, it's going to look like this. This is something a little thicker, um, so you're obviously not able to burn through it, but what you're going to see is it's never going to really create a weld puddle. So you can see here it's just kind of little dots where it, it's set up, and while you're under, when you're under the mass doing it, you're going to see that the actual wire is wanting to burn back up onto the tip of your, your MIG gun, and it may even fuse itself to the end of the gun and then it's going to wreck your consumables. Not good at all. Uh, again, this isn't going to be a weld that's going to really hold anything together at all. So that's the first one there. Now the next one is the exact opposite. This is where someone has the wire speed way too fast or possibly just far too cold. It's going to look something like this. It's going to look like a bunch of popcorn kind of just sitting on top of there like little kernels. And when you're doing the weld, it may even be kicking back in your hand. You may feel the wire kind of bouncing off of the metal, and that's no good as well. So it's going to create a lot of sparks, a lot of mess, more so than what you would normally find with MIG welding. And that's, again, not going to hold anything together. And you might even see, like, like I, can just break, I can just break this weld off. It's not, it's not sitting, it's not doing anything but just sitting on top here. So that's a, that was like a proud weld that didn't penetrate at all. It was just sitting on top of the surface. So you don't want to do this. It's really dangerous. It's not going to hold anything together. So you want, definitely want to avoid that. Now the next one we're going to show you, the last one, is if you're using solid core wire that requires a shielding gas, um, you may run out of gas or you may possibly have a hole in your line or your gas regulator could be uh, broken, could be any number of those things. It's going to have a weld that looks like this. It's going to have a lot of porosity in the weld, if you can see in the close up there. Um, there's all kinds of little holes and pits in the weld. Um, that's because the shielding gas didn't keep the weld puddle pure and all these impurities that are in just floating around in the air on your workbench, in your hands, everything, they got into this weld and made it impure and caused those, those little pits. And that's going to be a really weak weld. That's not going to even hold something together if you spot weld it. It's not going to work. So if you run out of gas and you try to think that, oh, I can just get away with doing a quick spot weld with the gas out, it's not going to work. It's not going to hold anything together. So check your gas. Make sure your gauge says you have the correct amount of gas. The knobs, of course, turned on. We've all forgotten that at least once, or that you don't have a hole in the line or something like that. So that's that one right there. So now that we've showed you those, a key thing that you want to learn as you're beginning to get better at welding is learn how to listen to your weld. Uh, any professional or, or experienced welder, they can listen to a weld and they could probably tell you how your settings are incorrect. So you may be welding across the room. You could have a guy that's really experienced. He could say, oh, by the sound of that, I can tell your, your wire speed's way too fast. So I'm going to do each of these welds incorrectly for you and try to really um, dramatize them so you can hear the sound of what they, what they uh, sound like. And also we'll show you the result live here on camera. So I'm going to start with the first one that we talked about, which was way too hot with the wire speed too slow. So I'm going to try and replicate this right here um, as we go along. So let's get set up. So as I'm doing this, just listen, you're going to hear a loud hissing, like gas sound. Um, that's basically because it's not really getting that arc going correctly. So um, we're going to get rid of the little bald tip on the end. That's a little tip that you want to make sure you do anytime before you weld. Just make sure you check your wire and that it's not, uh, it doesn't have a little ball on the end of it because that's going to, that's going to be a bad start to your weld. Um, even when I'm trying to produce a bad weld, that's still just habit. So let's go with this one here.
So you could hear there, it was really loud, like the gas sound. You didn't hear that, that sound we were talking about, like, the, uh, like a frying bacon sound. That's what you want to hear. There you just heard a loud gas sound. And that's just, there was just a lot of gas coming out and not much arc happening. So if you could have seen really close, the wire was wanting to burn back onto the tip. And I actually kind of had to be careful that and melt the wire to the tip. That would have been end game. I would have had to take my consumables apart, take the tip and the nozzle out and replace them and cut the wire and everything. So that's what that one right there is. And that's, that's the sound you're gonna be listening for. I know you need to turn your wire speed up quite a bit or possibly just turn, turn the heat down. So now that we did that one, we're going to show you the next one, which is um, the opposite, like I said, where your wire speed is just far too, far too high, maybe you have a bad ground, um, or your heat's just plain too well. So let me just change the settings here to kind of get that to happen. So we're going to turn the wire speed down, or I'm sorry, up, and the, uh, the heat down quite a bit here. I'm going to try and recreate that... Uh, that look for you, or uh, that weld for you that we, uh, that you st we gave you a look at earlier. So let's do this one now. So you could probably hear there, completely different sound than the other one. And it sounded like just a bunch of popcorn kind of just popping and spitting. And uh, I was making a much more of a mess you probably noticed there as well. So that's, one, that's that one right there. Again, it's sitting really proud on the top. And once this cooled down, I could probably just break it off with a pair of pliers or with my hands with uh, little to no trouble. So in this instance, remember, you're going to want to turn either your heat up or maybe just need to turn your wire speed down. So you could just do that on a test piece on the side and then go back to your workpiece and lay a nice, nice clean, uh, strong weld. So the last one that we talked about that I'm going to recreate here is basically like I mentioned where you have little or no gas. So this could mean that you need to turn your gas up or again check your, your setting. So I'm going to turn the gas off on the machine here, the sheathing gas is off. Close it up and we have to just run a little bit out to get the, uh, the gas out of the machine. So. Just run it till we got nothing. So we're out, of, we're out of gas now. So this would be the same as if your bottle ran out or you, know, you have a hole in the line. Or this could even be, like I said, if you have some slag or something in there like that. So let's do that one here and you can see what it, what it looks like and what it sounds like. So you can hear that one, a little different sound, a little similar to the uh, Too Fast, but um, has a, a slightly different sound. And you can see just how porous that welds are, those welds are. So it just looks really rough, like a, just like molten lava or something in there. So you're going to want to make sure, again, check your gas. Make sure it's right. If your gauge is really low, it could be off. So this is a common thing that people come across, and just want to make sure you check your gas at all times before you weld. So now that we showed you what bad welds look and sound like, I'm going to run one, try and get the machine set up pretty, pretty good for this thickness of metal. I'm going to run a uh, nice long bead on here, and then you can check out what it sounds like. Again, listen for that frying bacon sound. That's what you want to be listening for. That's the key to uh, you know, listening for a good weld. So let's uh, change our settings here. go and uh, now I'm gonna weigh a pretty decent weld um, so you can really hear the, the sound let's go So you can probably really hear the difference in sound there. Make sure I have my pliers because this is going to be hot. This penetrated the metal. It's going to uh, put a, definitely a bit of heat into this. So there you go. 
So that's the, that's the result by changing my settings and balancing my wire speed and my heat just right for this piece of metal. So you could really hear that frying bacon sound, that loud, crisp pop as it's welding. Um, that's what you want to listen for. That's the key, and that's how you know you got a nice, a nice weld just by, by listening to the welder. So now that we got that done, I'm going to show you and talk about a couple of tips and tricks here to, uh, to make, you, make your weld joints much better. So say you got your welds down like we talked about, you got the technique and everything down. There's a couple of things you can do to make your welds better. Now the first thing, it might seem really obvious and we, we've, I've been talking about it a bit, it's making sure that you keep the metal clean. The cleaner the metal before you start welding the better. MIG welding is a little more forgiving than say TIG welding where it needs to be almost surgically clean. But even with MIG welding, you want to make that joint as clean as possible. So if you're working on rusty metal, where it has like an oily coating on it to keep it from rusting that you know you got when you got the metal new if it's replacement metal or primer or anything like that. You need to, need to take it down to bare metal to get the best possible joint. So there's a couple products that I use. Um, you know you could use something as simple as our pre or even our after weld. This works well to etch the metal and clean it before you start welding. And then the obvious things using a wire brush, an angle grinder, sandpaper, anything like that to get the metal at the very least down the bare metal and then I, I do these additional things to clean my pieces before I start welding and that really creates a nice strong clean joint. So that's with the cleaning. Now the other thing is like we mentioned with doing lap joints like this or if we're doing like a spot weld or something like this where metals overlapping each other. It's a new Eastwood product we have that's really cool and it's really handy. I use it all the time. It's a self etching weld through primer. So you all probably know about the self-etching, what it does, you know, they put on bare metal to keep it from corroding or rusting. Uh, this adds the capabilities of a weld-through primer. So now what you want to do is spray both pieces with this primer beforehand. It's going to etch the panel and it's going to also be weld-through so you can weld right on top. Now what this does is when this panel is welded, over time if you don't do that, that corrosion in there where the, where the paint, where it's bare metal, it's going to rust, it's going to start to corrode. If you've ever seen a restoration or repair work where it starts to rot around a joint where someone say put a quarter panel or something like that on, it's probably because they didn't back the metal up, they didn't protect it, uh, they didn't protect the metal that they backed up. So they might not have sprayed any primer at all, they sprayed a, sp sprayed a primer that wasn't, uh, couldn't handle the heat from welding. So this primer is really good for that and that's going to make your welds last and it's also going to make your, uh, your repair last the lifetime of the vehicle. So now they gave you some of those tips and tricks. The, uh, the last thing is technique. I'll show you a little technique that I do that helps a lot of people with making visually appealing welds. It's, uh, you're going to do basically a little letter O or C, you can imagine, with your welder, with a nozzle. And I usually do, I use two hands. You kind of balance with one hand like this. And you use your other hand, kind of just do little letter O's or little letter C's. That's the best way to describe it. And what you're doing is when you're welding, you're pushing that puddle along and kind of working back into that puddle. And that's going to make sure that your puddle overlaps as it goes. So you have a, a nice weld without any, um, any gaps in between the weld. And it's really good if you're doing anything where you get into welding, anything that needs to be airtight or liquid tight, anything like that. This is really good because you're not going to have to go back and spot weld over top of your, over top of your welds. So I'm going to set the welder up here again and we'll, uh, we'll try and dramatize the uh, doing that weld. So we'll flip this one over. I already did some welding on here. And uh, I'll try and do the, uh, the letter O's or C's that we're talking about. I'll try and dramatize where I move my hands as much as possible. Um, hopefully you can see it on camera with all the flashing and everything. But uh, then we'll do a close up and you can kind of see the, uh, the puddle. You can probably see where I was doing my little movements with my hand. So uh, let's go. So, I don't know if you guys can see that or not, but uh, I tried to move my hands quite a bit there so you could see. Um, now, if we can get a close-up there, 
You could probably see the little kind of lines where the puddle was overlapping itself as they went. Now you can, when you get a little more experienced, you can see some guys that really start playing with their settings and they can get almost a, uh, a stack of dimes TIG weld look, um, which is really, really neat. But anything like this is gonna be, it's gonna be fine. It's gonna penetrate. You can see that it's not sitting too proud above the surface or anything like that. It's nice and flat. And uh, you can see those little kind of arcs where I was moving my hand to push the puddle along. So I practice that at home, get a bunch of scrap metal. Um, this is something that you're probably not gonna be able to do on sheet metal. So don't, uh, I mean, you, you may be able to do it a little bit, but with MIG welding, it's really tough to do that kind of weld on, on sheet metal. So don't just go right to sheet metal and start trying to do your letter C's or letter O's. Um, it's probably not going to work. You're going to want to do it more on heavier, heavier metal and fabrication and joints is where you're going to really put that into play. So now that we got everything, uh, we went over everything for the basics of welding. I hope you guys learned a little bit here, gave you a little insight, and you can listen and uh, look at your welds and diagnose them along the way and uh, help you produce a better weld. Uh, we got a few extra minutes, so we'll do any kind of Q&A. So if anybody has any questions, I have one of the guys in the back here read it off to me, and I'll try to answer it the best I can on the fly. Um, and hopefully uh, get anything you guys have questions about answered that haven't maybe already been answered in the chat or so far. So do we have anything, guys, for, uh, for a question? Um, generally on the, on the bottle here, there's two, there's two sets of numbers. There's going to be like a, an L slash like min or a CFH that you see. A, a common thing that we come across um, when people were, were first setting their machine up or their bottle up is that they actually read the wrong numbers when people, when people post online or talk about like, oh, you need to be at 8 or 10 um, or 15 or whatever they prefer their settings to be. People read the wrong numbers. So on the, if you look on the inside, the numbers are actually higher than the ones on the outside. So you want to make sure that you, you clarify which ones. Um, and I don't know if you guys can even see here. I'll lift the bottle up. Hopefully you can see. A little tough. So you want to make sure that you're, when, when your settings are just right. So I usually run, if I'm just doing general, um, <clears throat> if I'm in the shop and I'm just doing general, like repair or work or whatever. I try and keep it somewhere around like 10, 8 to 10 is, is a good range if there's not, if you're not anywhere there's going to be any kind of wind or anything blowing. Because the key is you don't want the wind to be blowing when you're, when you're welding and push away your shielding gas. So when I do that, like I said, I go, I go by those numbers right on the outside that we showed you. I try and keep it around, around 8 to 10. So when you're hitting the trigger, you want to make sure that it stays right around that level. So don't set it at 8 and then hit the trigger and think you're good because it might drop down to 0. So you may need to, to adjust it as necessary. So if you're working at home and you're outside in the driveway or something like that, you may need to crank that gas all the way up or you may need, need to even switch to like a flux core wire that actually you don't need the gas anymore. So hopefully that, that helps you with, uh, with that a little bit. Uh, next one. I I read a lot of um, I read a lot about welding because I'm by no means like a professional. I wouldn't consider myself like a like a season. You know, I don't have all the certification to do overhead overhead and all this these type of things. But I've been welding for a long time, doing a lot of restorations, and I have a little bit of experience. I personally push when I when I weld. If I'm just doing something like we're doing right there. I read a lot of things that some people say that if you pull, it's better. Um, some people, you know, left to right. And I think it really depends on what the key is, what's comfortable to you to produce, to produce a clean, solid weld. So I mean, obviously it's different if you're welding an industrial type thing or you're doing something that's, uh, that's a whole nother level. So today we're, we're sticking on just beginners, like if you're doing some automotive repair and things like that, what feels comfortable to you? So like I said, I generally push, um, depending on the joint or if you're working on a, a spot on a vehicle, you can't get in there to push. You may have to start and, and do a pull. But I generally push because when I'm doing the C's and O's, I can kind of push that along. It makes it easier for me. So that's just the way I learn and what's got comfortable. Um, try it out for you. Both might be better. Um, but that, that's my personal preference.
Um, core flux wire is basically, um, well, I'll go back. Um, the core, I'm sorry, the, the question was, what was uh, the difference between uh, flux core wire and, like, the shield and solid core wire? So what it is is basically the shielding gas. So with solid core wire, you have a shielding gas. So that is going to create that gas that we talked about, like when I was talking about the settings and the wind and, um, you know, with the porous weld. That basically creates like a fog of the gas around your weld puddle and keeps it pure. So as you're welding, you need that gas of some sort. So flux core wire actually has like a coating on it that's, uh, that's surrounding the wire that creates that. So when you melt the wire, it actually creates that gas and it will keep the weld pure. So that's really great if you're welding outside or in conditions that are less than optimal for using gas. So it's going to create that shielding gas as you weld. Now the downside of flux core that I tend to shy away from, if at all possible when doing like automotive repair and things like that, is it's a bit more messy. Because of the flux core, it creates a lot more mess, a lot more cleanup, and it's definitely a little more difficult to create a, a really clean, visually appealing weld. So you can make strong welds with it, and it's definitely something that's uh, a viable option. But if you're trying to do like, like sheet metal repair and things like that, it's really tough because it also doesn't come and as small of a, of a gauge wire as the, uh, as the solid core does. So it's going to be more difficult to weld thin gauge without blowing through just because of the, the size of the wire. Any other? Um, the, the, I'm sorry, the question was uh, what situation, I'll try and paraphrase it, what situation would be best to use um, flux core versus uh, solid core other than if you were out of gas. Um, as I mentioned a little bit, it's, it's something where the gas would get blown away. So it's a, a for the general way to talk about it is when the, if the gas was to get blown away. So if you're, again, if you're in a windy situation, if you're in an area where maybe you can't, um, where, where you just can't get out of a breeze or wind or anything like that, that's going to get blown away. That's the most, the most um, typical situation where you choose flux core because you need to get that shielding gas needs to stay right over the weld puddle. So that's when I would choose over that. Me personally, I really prefer to use gas. So if at all possible, I'm going to try and bring the vehicle inside, shield myself, shield the area that you're working in so you can use that solid core. Cause I, I just don't like the cleanup of using flux core, but it's great for beginners. And if, it's a necessity that you have to work outside. Um, it, it's great to use. It's just please remember that you're going to have to be doing a little bit of cleaning. Um, we do sell a product that you could spray on before and after um, the welds that are going to help uh, you know, resist some of those little pieces that fly around from doing flux core, but it's still going to be a lot of cleanup. Um, somebody asked about talking about wire size. Um, it's a pretty broad question, but I'll probably shorten it into the most common sizes of wire to use. Um, when you're doing like sheet metal repair and real thin gauge stuff, I like to use 023 or 0 0.6. Um, that's really, really good for using like sheet metal um, versus 030. So 030 is a little thicker gauge. That's something that you may use um, for a little heavier fabrication. And then there's like 035 and it goes up in size depending on what you're doing. Some of the more industrial machines are gonna have much, um, much larger gauge wire. But uh, when you're doing automotive repair and stuff like that, generally 030 and 023, 0 0.6 or 0 0.8, are the most common solid core wires that you're gonna use. And I try and stick to the 023 for whenever I'm doing sheet metal repair. So if I'm doing like a patch panel or anything like that, you wanna try and use 023 because it requires less heat to melt and it's going to create a smaller spot weld. So if you get your machine sitting just right with the 023 or 0.6, you can make really, really tiny, small spot welds that don't require hardly any grinding. Um, the 030 is going to do, or 0.8 is going to do a lot more, um, like thicker gauge stuff like we're doing here. That's what I was using today was the 030 wire. Um, it's a good all around wire. You can make it work on sheet metal, but depending on the instance, uh, you may need to change the spool out. So that was pretty much it for all of the questions that we have so far. Thanks for the questions. Thanks for watching, chatting. Um, if you have any ideas for any future live demos or anything you'd like to see us do 
live on camera, um, we'd love to hear it. Um, we really like to do it. We think it's an intera interactive way for you, the customer, to get involved with us, Eastwood. And uh, any of the products that we talked about, like I mentioned, we have listed under the screen here on the landing page. You can check them out. Some of them have Greek discounts. Um, you can even check out this welding table that we're using here. Um, we have these nice portable, foldable welding tables um, that were featured in this video. You can use those. So you can stop welding on a stump or a, you know, cement, cinder block, anything like that. This is a really nice option. They're pretty affordable, and they've been, been doing really well on the site. So thanks again, and we'll check you out later in the next uh, live feed.